gentlemen, welcome to the Zhang Yueran um, reading event. Zhang Yueran is a young writer from China who has published five books in China, each of which has sold more than 300,000 copies. And so far, two of them have been translated and published by Math Paper Press. You see them behind me, The Promised Bird and Ten Loves. Promised Bird is a novel set in 15th century Indonesia, amongst other places. Ten Loves is a short story collection that you'll hear a bit of this evening. And Miss Zhang will be signing copies later. Um, do feel free to come forward. Everyone's kind of hiding at the back of the room. Oh. I'm not sh uh, right. Yes, no. Well, if you if you just came in here to look at books, think of this as an unexpected bonus, a reading by one of China's hottest young writers. Um, Hello. Miss Zhang is here from Beijing. Uh, she just arrived yesterday for the Singapore Writers' Festival. Along with this event, she'll also be doing two panels at the Writing Festival tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. and 11.30 a.m., one in English and one in Mandarin. So take your pick. Um, I'll now invi invite you around to read a passage from the novel she's currently working on, which is called Jian or Cocoon. Okay, so I'm going to start. Mommy only has little gong, and little gong only has mommy. This was something mommy often said before pulling him into her bosom and gently stroking the walls of her hair at the back of his head. Isn't that so? She breathed out only after he had nodded yes. This seemed a pointless question. Of course it was so. How else could it be? But mommy always asked, over and over. He didn't know at the time how circumscribed his life with mommy was thinking the world was just that small. He didn't go to kindergarten, not even outside to play. His mother had no friends and never visited relatives. At most, she might exchange a word or two on small talk when she ran into a neighbor downstairs. Lui Gong could count all the people he'd ever met on the fingers of one hand. Most of the time, they went nowhere at all, just stay at home. Home was two small rooms, no more than 30 square meters, crammed full. Mommy liked buying things, no matter how hard up they were. She wouldn't give up this little pleasure. A carousel-shaped music box whittled from an old classmate at the export farm. Cheap vases bought at a discount at the glass factory gates. An almost mute vinyl record player. She was like a swallow building its nest. Arriving home every day bearing some new friend. These useless objects were prominently displayed. The things they actually needed, shoes, umbrellas, basins, were considered not beautiful and shoved under the bed. So crowded, they occasionally popped halfway out to get a breath of air. Their home was as full as tightly sealed as a tin can. Time couldn't find a way in, which may be why these days seemed to pass so slowly. His father existed, and even came to visit sometimes, usually late at night. Drinking of alcohol, the red veins in his eyes fit to explode. To Lu Gong, he was a wild animal that might leap out at any time to mow their lives. He never had a proper job, but always seemed busy, claiming to work in transport to cover what really filled his days. Drink, dice, women. It seemed these activities were needed to burn off the energy that suffused his body. And if there was any left over, then he would use it to beat mommy. As far back as Lu Gong could remember, his mother was always being beaten. He saw how she got used to it. 
All she wished was for her son to be safely asleep by the time by the time violence started. If he wasn't, or if he got startled awake, she hoped for him to pretend he was. No crying, no noise. That way, it would be over sooner. And so Lu Gong lay in the dark, trying to stifle his breathing as a reward or compensation. After it was all over and mommy returned to him, she let him clutch at her breasts, so he fell asleep with a nipple in his mouth. Based in moonlight, the small cones of her breast seemed as pure and white as a goddess's. As long as he rested his head on them, the nightmares wouldn't find him. But there were also evenings when mommy didn't come back to bed. When he awoke in the gap between dreams, he leapt from bed and saw his parents on the split open sofa. Daddy's big brown hands closed around the goddess's breasts. In the morning, mommy would slip back into her rightful bed, but not to sleep. Leaning against the headboard, she hugged herself staring into space. He examined the cigarette burn blisters on her shoulders. Gently running a finger over their shiny surface gave him a strong sensation. He counted the bruises on her body, so many patches, like dark clouds across the sky just before a storm. New ones appear before the old, the old had time to heal. Only after he grew up did Lu Gong discover not all women had the had skin like his mother's, so thin as to be almost transparent, fine blue veins visible just before the surface, so fragile it rock at the slightest pressure. Lu Gong liked his mother's wounds. They made her especially beautiful. He thought she must like herself this way. Perhaps she came into this world in order to be hurt. Lu Gong could never remember the first time he followed Mummy shopping at Taekang Food Store. Afterwards, Daddy kept asking him when it was. Perhaps if no one had been forcing him to think about it, he might not have forgotten. His only memory is that it was afternoon. Mummy brought him to buy some snacks at Taekang. The man was a cashier at the store, his body covered with a fine layer of the powdered sugar from selling sweets all day. Sickly sweet. Lu Gong couldn't remember his name, or perhaps never knew it. He called him Uncle Honey. Every time he went in with Mummy, Uncle Honey stuffed a big handful of colorful honey sweets into his pocket. That's too many. A few will do. Mommy simpered. I won't dare come again if you are going to be like this. Yet, two days later, they were back, and his pockets full of honey sweets again. The shop wasn't busy in the afternoon, and Mommy could lean against the counter talking to Uncle Honey in a stop-start stop kind of way. The counter was taller than his head, so he sat under it eating his honey sweets, smoothing the wrappers out. Suddenly, he heard Mommy sobbing somewhere overhead, her shadow trembling. She reached for, he, he reached for her, but Uncle Honey already held both her hands. Before they left, Uncle Honey gave him more honey sweets. He couldn't finish them and fell asleep with one still in his mouth. So even his dreams were permeated with the smell of aniseed. One day, he woke from such a licorice dream to find the house empty and mommy missing. She'd gone in such a hurry, she'd taken nothing with her and left nothing behind. All he had to remember her by were two great cavities caused by all the honey sweets. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Yuran. That was from Yuran's novel in progress, Cocoon. Now I will read a section from um, Ten Loves, which um, is now published in English by Math Paper Press, translated by myself. And this is from a story called White Bone Harp. She carefully removes the collarbone from her left shoulder and gives it to her husband. There is a crisp snapping sound as the bone separates from its neighbor. She feels the sharp wind entering this new hole, eddying through her body like a whirlpool. Shivering, she sprawls against the cold wall. Her husband's eyes gleam as he studies this bright bone. Nimbly, he takes it from her. Of course, he doesn't forget to thank her, pressing his enchanting lips to white bone's forehead. A chill is spreading over her face, but her cheeks are still peony pink. He kisses her frantically, whispering endlessly how grateful he is, how much he loves her. White bone spirit now sleeps under three quilts. With so many bones pulled out of her, her body is all holes. The early autumn wind shouldn't be so cold. She trembles with it, a kite about to take off. Her husband makes musical instruments. Previously, he made flutes and pipes. Right now, he is working on a harp, which has so far incorporated 37 of her bones, far more than any previous instrument. The frame is made from the stronger bones of arm and shoulder, with some softer ones like ribs thrown in for flexibility. This is his best work so far. The carving has already taken three times as long as he'd planned. She spends many nights propped up in bed, watching him raise his shimmering knife, carving her bones until they gleam like ivory. His little fingernail is an inch long. He traces it across the harp and notes rise into the air like water droplets, entrancing. He throws open the window and birds flock inside, the notes hit the ceiling and shatter, broken droplets that the birds swoop on before scattering. The house is quiet again. Her husband's face is flushed. He is lost to the crystalline sound. Only after a long time does he rush to the bed to cradle his limp wife, stroking her few remaining bones with infinite tenderness, his voice trembling as he says, Darling, you are the best. You'll always be the best. The white bone spirit lives for this moment. She adores her husband's stolid red face. The moment he flings the windows open and birds crash into his chest, how he stumbles like a child to her bedside and pours a waterfall of caresses over her. Of course, she loves the music too, water droplets and birds. Some nights her body feels like an old clock, moving more slowly than real time, allowing great gusts of wind to pierce her. Her white skirt fills with wind and billows like a sail. White bone spirit feels sad that her right collarbone is next. She loved those collarbones. You could see them poking out of her white dress, shining faintly through her pinkish skin, the color of azaleas. That first summer, the instrument maker watching her steadily as if possessed, following her. White bone weeps as she tugs at the bone. Now she will be unable to wear her silver necklace, and sure enough, the instant the bone leaves her, it slips off, sliding right inside her. Her whole body is filled with the sound of tinkling metal. Worse, the pendant is a sharp-edged rhombus, sure to slice her insides to bloody ribbons. Her husband gave her this necklace, placing it around her neck so gently, the metal gently tapping her collarbone, ding, ding. Her husband was enchanted. That was in the autumn. Seeing Whitebone cry, her husband hastily says, Darling, don't be sad. So what if you lose all your bones? I'll love you forever. You're the best. Lift your head. Look at our achievement. Behind him are many priceless instruments. Like oversized furniture, they dominate the house. Did they really come from her body? How could they look so huge now? When the heart is three bones short of completion. White bone grows depressed. She has calculated that by the time the instrument is finished, she will have used up all her bones. This satisfies her. 
She doesn't mind sacrificing her bones, even though she can no longer raise her head and spends much of the day slumped in the wide bed. Her husband bought her a wooden frame to help her move. It makes her look like a clumsy marionette. But then, what does it matter? She is happy to spend the whole day simply waiting for night. Night brings her red-faced husband, his footsteps, his embrace, the notes rising to the sky. This is enough for her. And that's from White Bone Spirit from Ten Loves, a short story collection about unconventional love stories, I think is the best way to put it. Um, we will take questions from the floor now, if there are any. Does anyone have a question for Yuran about her writing or about the translation process? What's the biggest challenge uh, in making this book into a reality in print? Because uh, between the Chinese and the English version, is there a difference? Uh, well, as a translator, my job is to capture Yuan's voice as far as possible. So to find what makes her work distinctive in Chinese and try to replicate that in English. Um, so hopefully there isn't too much of a difference, though of course no two works in different languages can ever be identical. Um, I think the biggest challenge is the strangeness of the voice. There's something very unsettling about Yuran's writing, something that although the surface seems calm, you can tell that there's a lot going on underneath, and it's almost as much about what goes unspoken. And so to make that... Um, explicable to an English readership, uh, to get that same quality of, of eeriness, I guess was something I had to work hard to achieve. I had a sense that uh, from her readings and the book that I saw uh, through the pages, it seems to me that she has some form of a spiritual connection uh, or experience. Uh, is, is, that, uh, is there, is there a, uh, a connection to it? To your writings? Do you, is there a spiritual uh, connection to, to, I mean, to your experience? Well, is it because my horoscope is Scorpio? <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah. I don't know. Actually, it's quite different. I mean, the Ten Loves and my new novel is quite different. I think mm, <coughs> only in Ten Loves, it's that what you said, yeah. I have a question mm -hmm. <coughs> about uh, your new book, mm -hmm. the one you're writing. Mm -hmm. Domestic violence mm -hmm. is not a sub topic mm -hmm. that is on the surface on Chinese media. Perhaps you hear some stories, but they tend to happen in the countryside. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think that um, your you will give visibility through your novel to this issue, which is, you know, I don't know the statistics, but mm -hmm. it's, you know, China being now a modern society, mm -hmm. you could imagine that this is this problem that happens in the West is yeah. also happening in China right mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. I think for for this book, it's only a small part of the uh, of the main character's uh, childhood, and which was actually the experience of one of my friends. So it's kind of a real story. So, but I don't know the statistics either. But yeah, yes, it, I think it's, it, it, it happened quite often in when I was a child. At that, uh, I, I think maybe in 1990s at that time, yeah. It happened quite often, but I don't know now. I think it's, it should be less. Any other questions? 